thoroughly shuffle a deck of cards and the chances are that you've just done something unique. Almost certainly no one in the history of the world has ever come up with the deck arranged in that particular order before. The reason's simple. 52 different cards can be arranged in 52 times 51 times 50 times 49 all the way to 3 times 2 times 1 ways. That's a grand total of about 8 times 10 to the 67 or 80 million trillion 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 different orderings of the cards. If all the people presently alive were to have shuffled a card deck once every second since the universe began, that would amount to only about 3 times 10 to the 27 shuffles, which is an incredibly tiny number by comparison. Yet there have been claims of decks being shuffled and coming out in exactly the order they started when new. This is actually much more likely than the odds of 1 in 8 times 10 to the 67 of getting any other ordering. When first taken out of its wrapper, a card deck has all the suits, hearts, clubs, diamonds and spades, though not necessarily in that order, arranged ace, two, three, and so on, jack, queen, king. If the dealer is so expert as to be able to riffle shuffle without a mistake, splitting the deck in two and exactly interleaving the cards together, the pack can end up back where it was after just eight perfect shuffles. That's why casinos often use a child's approach to shuffling with a brand new deck, known as washing the deck, in which the cards are just spread on the table and swished around willy-nilly for a while. To get a similar level of disorder would take at least seven good but imperfect riffle shuffles. The outcome would then be pretty random. In other words, shown any one card in the deck, the odds of being able to predict the next card, using any fair means available, would be very close to 1 in 51. But would the deck be truly random? What is randomness? And is it ever possible to have something that's completely random? The notion of randomness or total unpredictability has been around as long as civilization and probably much longer. Flipped coins and rolled dice most obviously spring to mind as ways we commonly use today to randomly decide outcomes. Back in ancient Greece, they tossed astragali or the knuckle bones of goats and sheep in their gambling games. Later they also used regular shaped dice, though where dice first came from isn't known for sure. The Egyptians are thought to have used dice in their game of Senate 5,000 years ago. The Rig Veda, a Vedic Sanskrit text dating back to about 1500 BC, also mentions dice, and actual dice games have been found in Mesopotamian tombs dating back to the 24th century BC. Greek tessera were cubic and had numbers on each side from 1 to 6, but it was only in Roman times that dice like those we use today, in which values on opposite sides add up to 7, first appeared. It took a long time for randomness to catch the attention of mathematicians. Before that, it was mainly thought to be the province of religion. In both Eastern and Western philosophies, the outcome of many events was thought to be in the lap of the gods or some equivalent supernatural force. From China came the I Ching, classic of changes, a system of divination rooted in the interpretation of 64 different hexagrams. Some Christians base their decision-making on the rather simpler method of drawing straws from inside a Bible. Fascinating though these early beliefs were, they had the unfortunate effect of greatly delaying any rational attempts to come to grips with randomness. After all, if eventualities are determined ultimately at some level beyond human comprehension, why bother trying to analyse logically why anything happens the way it does? Why try to figure out if there are natural laws that govern the probability of outcomes? It's hard to believe that those who used astragali or dice in ancient Greek or Roman times 
didn't have at least some intuitive feel for the likelihood of certain outcomes. Usually, where money or other material gain is concerned, gamblers and other interested parties quickly catch on to the fine detail of the games they play. So, it seems likely that an intuitive appreciation of odds goes back millennia. But the academic study of randomness and probability had to wait until the 17th century and the late Renaissance to take off. Spearheading the breakthroughs at this time were the French mathematician and philosopher Blaise Pascal, who was also a devout Jesuit, and his compatriot Pierre de Fermat. These two great thinkers tackled a problem that in simplified form can be put like this. Suppose two people are playing a coin tossing game where the first person to get three points wins a pot of money. The game is interrupted with one person leading by two points to one. If the pot is handed out at this stage, what is the fairest allocation? Before Pascal and Fermat, Others had thought about this and come up with a variety of possible solutions. Maybe the pot should be divided evenly since the game was stopped part way and the eventual outcome couldn't be known, but this seemed unfair to the person with two points, who should surely get some credit for being ahead. On the other hand, another suggestion, to hand the whole pot to the person in the lead looked unfair on the opponent with one point who would still have had a chance of winning had the game gone on. A third possibility might be to divide the pot based on the number of points gained, so that the player with two points would get two-thirds of the prize and the opponent one-third. On the face of it, this seems fair, but there's a problem with it. Suppose the score was 1-0 at the point the game was interrupted. In this case, if the same rule were applied, the person with one point would receive the entire pot, while the other person, who might still have won if the game ran to its intended conclusion, would get nothing. Pascal and Fermat found a better solution and, at the same time, opened up a new branch of maths. They calculated the probability of each person winning. In order for the person with one point to win, they would have to get two further points in a row which has a probability of a half times a half, or a quarter. They should therefore receive one quarter of the pot. The rest should go to their opponent. Exactly the same method can be applied to any other problem of this type, although naturally the calculations can become more complicated. In studying this problem, Pascal and Fermat had hit upon a concept known as expected value. In a gambling game or any situation where chance is involved, the expected value is the average of what you can reasonably hope to gain. For example, suppose you played a game where you rolled a die and won $6 if you rolled a 6. This game has an expected value of $1, which means that if you paid $1 to play, it would be a fair game. A lottery, by contrast, generally has a negative expected value, so that, from a rational point of view, it's a bad idea to play. During certain rollovers, depending on the lottery, it may occasionally have a positive expected value. The same is true of casino games for an obvious reason. The casino is a business trying to make a profit. Occasionally, though, things can go wrong due to a slight error in calculation. In one instance, a casino changed the payout on just one outcome in blackjack, accidentally making the expected value positive, and lost a fortune within a few hours. Casinos depend on an intimate knowledge of the mathematics of probability theory for their livelihood. Sometimes coincidences happen that seem so unlikely that people wonder if something funny is going on. A person may win their state lottery twice, or the same numbers may come up in different drawings. Often the media jump on such stories and make a big deal out of their seemingly wild improbability. The truth is, however, that most of us aren't very good at figuring out the likelihood of such events because we start out with some misconceptions. To take the case of someone who won the same lottery twice, 
it's natural to personalize the problem and think, what are the chances of me winning the lottery twice? Obviously, the answer is fantastically small. However, the rare people who win twice tend to have played regularly over a number of years, so that any two wins over that period is less remarkable. More importantly, it has to be borne in mind how many people play the lottery. The vast majority will never win the jackpot once, never mind twice. But with all those people playing, it becomes much less astonishing that someone, somewhere, will take the prize on two occasions. This misjudgment of odds based on a failure to consider all the possibilities for an event to happen also underlies the so-called birthday paradox, which is really not a paradox at all. With 23 people in a room, the odds that two of them will have the same birthday are better than 50-50. It seems that the chances ought to be much smaller than that. You might argue that if it only takes 23 people to find a match, we should all know at least several people who share our birthday, whereas it's always surprising when it happens. But the birthday paradox doesn't ask what are the chances of any one person in the room, you for instance, finding a birthday match, but of any two people being born on the same date. The odds of this are 1 minus 365 over 365 times 364 over 365 times 363 over 365 times and so on, 343 over 365, which equals 0.507, or 50.7%. With 60 people in a group, the odds of a birthday match climb to more than 99%. In contrast, for there to be a 50% chance of someone having the same birthday as you, 253 people would need to be present.